Feel the power. Welcome to a righteous invasion of truth with Dr. Abel Damina. Welcome to the ever increasing word feast right here on Facebook or YouTube, whichever social media platform you're watching from today. Abel Damina is my name. There is a mandate of God on my life to reintroduce Jesus to this generation, equipping the believer to know who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what Christ can do through you. That's what this broadcast is all about today. So get ready to unlearn so you can relearn the truths concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me also advise you in the course of teaching, certain questions may arise. Just be patient, pay attention, and listen carefully because scriptures will interpret scriptures as you patiently follow the teaching of God's word. You know, the Bible tells us that the time shall come when people shall not endure sound doctrine. So sound doctrine is to be endured. So endure. You know, the word of God also tells us that with meekness, you receive the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul with meekness. So there's a meekness required and there's endurance required where sound doctrine is concerned. So as the teaching of God's word begins to come, get your notebook, get your pen, follow the teachings. Most of my teachings are in a series because we take time to holistically look at subject matters in the light of Jesus Christ. Let me encourage those of you that are connecting for the first time today, get ready to keep following. We are right here on Facebook and YouTube every day. We're here at 12 noon, GMT plus one. We're here at 6 p.m. We're here at 10 p.m. Also, we are here every day at 10 a.m. GMT plus one, every day. You don't want to miss any of them because all of these times that I've mentioned, they are designed to equip you with sound knowledge of Jesus Christ. In the midst of a world of uncertainties, with all kinds of messages of fear going all over, you need to stock up, you need to feed yourself with the truth of the gospel so you're rooted and grounded and not moved to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Two more things to introduce to you today. If you are in a city where there is no church, Christ-centered church, where they teach the message of Christ, it is not good for you to be in isolation. The Bible says God has set the solitary in families. God wants you to be a part of a local assembly, a gathering of believers where you can pray together, learn the word of God together, and effectively serve one another and go out to the world and bring the gospel of Christ. If you want to join any of our campuses around the world today, or you want to start one in your own locality and be the lighthouse in that community, all you need to do is shoot me a mail today telling me about your desire to either be a part of a campus or to start one with your location and your phone number. We will get in touch with you and help you either begin one or identify with an existing one. The last thing is I have a lot of books, like you can see them displayed on the screen. All of these are resources written painstakingly to equip you, answer your questions, and bring you clarity of explanation of the Word of God. And if you want to order for any or all of the books today, all you need to do again is shoot email to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com and we'll respond to you properly and give you all the information you require to acquire these books. I'm excited, very excited. Invite a friend, tag somebody, create a watch party, but today is going to be a powerful time of teaching you the word of his grace. Fasten your seatbelts as I take you on a gospel adventure into a service where the spirit of our God is already moving. Happy viewing. Beginning a series on what I titled What Jesus Taught About Material Prosperity. What Jesus Taught About Material Prosperity. That's what we're going to be looking at today and for the next few days as the Holy Ghost will enable us. Um, because this has to do with money. There's been a lot of controversy around it. Um, a lot of controversy concerning the issue of the gospel and money and that ought not to be okay there shouldn't be any but because of the way things have been taught and preached over the years uh, it, it seems to create controversy so we trust God that in the course of this we will clarify a number of things and give you understanding and give you light so you can function within the light that is available to us can somebody shout hallelujah all right, 1 Corinthians 16 verse 1, now concerning the collection for the saints. As I have given order to the churches of Galatia, 
even so do ye. Next verse. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God had prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. The King James Version puts the word God in it, as God has prospered him, which implies that God prospers, that God influences the way we make money. All right? The word prosper there is the Greek word you do, which implies a journey. That's the word prosper. It implies a journey. So the word prosper means to have a prosperous journey. All right? Now, but because it is given, so it is material. That's why Brother Paul said, let him lay by him in store. All right? So this has to do with money, physical money. Now, but the word prosper there is key. Because I want us to examine that word. In Romans chapter 1 verse 10, Brother Paul used the word prosper. Making request, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. I might have a prosperous journey. Alright? So Paul used it not for material things, but for a smooth trip. A prosperous journey. And you will see why Paul prayed for a prosperous journey in Romans 15, 31 to 32. That I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea. That's why he prayed to have a prosperous journey. And that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints. 32. That I may come unto you with joy by the will of God and may with you be refreshed. And may with you be refreshed. That's what he meant by when he said, you know, a prosperous journey. It's the same thing, you know, Brother John prayed for Gaius in 3 John verse 1 and 2. The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee. Even as thou walkest in the truth. Verse 2 is not talking about material prosperity. Because now in verse 2 he is talking about prosper and be in health. Even as thy soul. is the same prayer Paul prayed for the church at Ephesus. The eyes of their understanding being enlightened. It's the same prayer Paul prayed for the church. I mean for Philemon. That the, 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 the communication of his faith may become effectual by the acknowledging. That's the same prayer John is praying for his beloved son, Gaius. Because Gaius was already a wealthy man. He was already a prosperous man in the material. So the prayer he was praying there, let's read it again in the pretext and post-text so you can see clearly. Because that scripture has been used over the years for material wealth. And that's why I'm taking time on it. The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Whom I love in doctrine, sound doctrine, teaching. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, spiritual health, even as thy soul prospereth. I want you to be in health. I want you to prosper spiritually. I want you to come to a place of revealed knowledge, a place of, of, of acknowledging every good thing that has been done in you in Christ. Then look at verse 3 so you understand verse 2. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. So he's dealing with revelation knowledge there when he was talking to his beloved son Gaius. So it's important for us to pay attention to context that something has been taught over the years and has been emphasized doesn't make it the truth. Sometimes we have to revisit the things we have learned before unlearn them so we can relearn, so we can walk within the light that is within the scriptures. So 1 Corinthians 16 is material because he mentioned lay by him in store. But the contention there is when he said as God, which implies that God has an influence on how men gather material things. Sometimes when a word is added to Bible interpretation by translators, it can be useful sometimes. And we will see how useful that word God, because that word God was added by translators. If you see, it's in bracket. It was not in the original. So we will find out that in the course of this teaching. So our study, therefore, is can this be allowed that God has influence in how people prosper materially? 
Can that be allowed within the context of Bible interpretation? Can that be allowed doctrinally that God influences the way people make money? That God influences the way we prosper materially? That God influences the way we get jobs and the way we, you know, um, increase in finances and the way money comes to us and the way we get money? Does God really influence all of that activity? That's what we want to examine critically and doctrinally. This is very, very important. I need all your ears as we get through this study. Now, we're going to be careful not to form an opinion. We're going to be very careful not to form an opinion. But rather, we want to arrive at the truth that the scripture teaches. We want to be careful not to form an opinion in the course of this study. We're going to be patient and all of us are going to travel together and arrive at the truth that the scripture teaches. So that if there was an opinion formed by you before now, as we look into the truth of the scriptures, we can correct such opinions. I don't know if you're with me here. To be able to get that, we've got to go through fundamentals. Again, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation, through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So it deals with our study of the scriptures itself. And this is Paul's hermeneutics or Paul's principle of interpretation of the Old Testament. He focuses there on salvation through faith which is in Christ. That is what brother Paul discusses with Timothy here. Salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus from the Holy Scriptures. From the Old Testament text. From Genesis to Malachi. Because that's all they had when they were writing this material. All they had was Genesis to Malachi. They didn't have the Gospels and they didn't have anything else. So if they were going to teach faith in Christ Jesus, it would be from Genesis to Malachi. So he now says to Timothy, from a child, you have known the holy scriptures, Genesis to Malachi, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. That the primary assignment of the holy scriptures, the Old Testament, is to bring a man to a place of wisdom in the doctrine or the teaching of salvation. And this salvation is through faith, which is in Christ Jesus only. So he must have selected what he taught from Genesis to Malachi, because... He narrows down everything that the Old Testament teaches as faith, salvation, through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. He narrows down the entire teachings of the Old Testament or the entire teachings of Genesis to Malachi to be salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Meaning, Brother Paul was selective in the materials that he brought out of the Old Testament to communicate with Timothy concerning the Holy Scriptures. So let's look at verse 16 now. Verse 16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. The word doctrine is the Greek word dadaskalia, which means teaching or explanation for doctrine. And the next word there he uses is for reproof. The word reproof there is the word evidence. The same word used in Hebrews 11.1, 1, Now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence, the evidence, the reproof, the evidence of things not seen. So the scriptures are given to us for doctrine and for evidence, for teaching, for explanation, and for evidence. Please follow carefully. The Old Testament or Genesis to Malachi are given to us for doctrine, for teaching, for teaching what? Evidence. Out of the Old Testament, we have teaching material, we have doctrinal material, and out of the Old Testament, we have evidence. We have evidence materials out of the Old Testament. Then the next word is, is there is for correction. For correction. The word correction is a Greek word, epenatosis. Epenatosis means to reset something the way it is supposed to be. To reset a mind. To reset something. To reset your mind the way it is supposed to be as it regards the evidence, which evidence of our teaching and explanation concerning salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And then he talks about righteousness, instruction in righteousness. The Greek word pedia, which means child training or raising a child, which will mean spiritual growth, that the scriptures are given to us for spiritual growth. So out of the scriptures, there is material that they are a believer ought to feed on for spiritual growth. 
just like you train a child. You feed a child. You raise a child. So he matures us from the scriptures by the instructions of the Old Testament material to a place of adulthood or maturity. The same thing in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 5, 7, 8, and 11. The same thing he talks about the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 5, verse 7, verse 8, and verse 11. Please, this is very important. So, obviously, he's saying that the doctrine of salvation is the core of Christian doctrine. The doctrine of salvation is the core of Christian doctrine. Within the Old Testament, what you will find as core material is salvation. The scriptures are also for persuasion, a message of faith. A message of faith that brings correction and spiritual growth. The scriptures are for persuasion. A message of faith. A message of faith that brings conviction and correction. A message of faith that brings spiritual growth. So this shows us therefore that the meal or the diet of the church is salvation. Okay? Salvation materials that enables us to grow spiritually. Now there is a method by which the Old Testament was studied deliberately and intentionally by the apostles. If you follow the pattern of their writings, there is a method that they used in studying the Old Testament material. Like I said previously, remember by this time, they didn't have any other material other than Genesis to Malachi. So brother Paul begins to give us certain instructions here in Romans chapter 16 verse 25. Now to him that is of power... To establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. Please pay attention. According to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. So the question is, how did they handle those books? And what did they teach from them? How did they handle the Old Testament books, Genesis to Malachi? And how did the apostles teach from them? Obviously, they didn't teach verbatim. They did not teach verbatim. Otherwise, it would be like recopying the Old Testament. So because they didn't teach verbatim, that is why you will see the way they wrote and the way they communicated the New Testament as to be different from the Old Testament. In fact, if you observe very carefully, you'll find out that the New Testament books are smaller than the Old Testament books. The New Testament books are smaller than the Old Testament books, which means what they taught was selected. What they taught from the Old Testament was selected. All right? Now, so what they did was to explain what the Old Testament was communicating. And that's why Brother Paul would say, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. Now, the word preaching there is the word kerugma. Kerugma is used for a specific information. It's taken from the Greek word keruzo, which means to announce something. It's used for preaching. So he takes the Old Testament and said the Old Testament is the preaching of Jesus Christ. That the Old Testament is the preaching of Jesus Christ. The mystery, the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret. And what was the revelation? The preaching of Jesus Christ according to the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation. So the Old Testament, therefore, is the preaching of Jesus Christ. The word kerugma. You will find that word in Matthew 12, 41. Kerugma. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Luke eleven thirty two. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Now, the preaching of Jonah. What it means is the information about Jonah. The preaching of Jonah. Specific information about Jonah. Kerugma. In Mark 16, 20, you will see Kerugma there. And they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord walking with them. And confirming the word with signs following, amen. So kerugma is an activity, something that is done. Preaching, kerugma, 
an activity, something that is done. So brother Paul takes the Old Testament and its activity as preaching to announce Jesus Christ. The Old Testament and its activity is to announce Jesus Christ. All right? To preach Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.21. See the way brother Paul will put it. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. By the foolishness of preaching. Don't forget the word preaching here was specific. Preaching what? The foolishness of the preaching of Jesus Christ. The foolishness of the preaching of Jesus Christ. Very important. Because if you look at verse 23, he now explains that preaching very clearly. But we preach Christ crucified. Specific. It's not just preaching. It's not just preaching. We preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block. And unto the Greeks foolishness. That's what we preach. We preach Christ crucified. Specific. We are not just preaching because it is in the Bible. So we just preach everything. No. We preach Christ crucified from Genesis to Malachi. All right. Please pay attention. Verse 18 of 1 Corinthians 1. He explains the preaching further. For the preaching of the cross. We preach Christ crucified for the preaching of the cross. Is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. The preaching of the cross. We preach Christ. Meaning is a specific information. We are not just preaching 10 steps to success. How to make it. You know, uh, uh, who is after you? Oh, who stole your shoe? Altar versus... No, no, no. The preaching is specific. The preaching is the preaching of the cross. Or we preach Jesus Christ. All right? We preach Jesus Christ. Specific. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 4. And my speech and my preaching was not in enthusing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of spirit and of power. All right? The kerugma there is in verse 2 of the same chapter. Verse 2. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Specific. Now please pay attention. I determined to know nothing among you from the preaching of the Old Testament. From the Old Testament materials, I determined to know nothing save Jesus Christ. That is when all the Old Testament materials are put together, what I look for in all is Jesus Christ. Are we following here? Specific information. Kerugma. I determined to know only Jesus Christ and him crucified. In other words, he ignored all the other stories, historical data. He just focused on the preaching of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 14. Why the preaching of Jesus Christ? Because if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. Your faith is also vain. Look at verse 2 and 3 of the same chapter. By which also you are saved. If you keep in memory what I preach unto you. Unless you have believed in vain. Next verse. For I delivered unto you first of all. That which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins. According to the scriptures. Christ died for our sins. That is what brother Paul said. I determined to know among you. Christ alone. Kerugma emphasizes the fact that it is a specific news. Very specific. In 2 Timothy 4.17, Brother Paul instructs Timothy, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. The Lord strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known. An activity. The preaching might be fully known. Titus chapter 1 verse 2 to 3. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world begun. But hath in due times manifested his word through preaching. He in due times, he has manifested his word through preaching. Which is committed unto me 
according to the commandment of God, our Savior. The word preaching there was a specific information. It wasn't general information. Designed for the city, tied in the village. No, the preaching there was specific information. It was not just anything you saw. Maybe you have the spirit of Jezebel. Maybe you are Ahab. May you not be an Ahab. No, the preaching there was specific. Maybe Jezebel is the one troubling you. No, the preaching was specific. Out of the Old Testament, the, the way the apostles studied it and handed it over to us was specific information, not generalized information. If I'm communicating, say, I hear you. Specific. May you not end like Delilah. No, no, that's not the information. May you not end like Samson. No, the preaching there is specific. Preaching is not preaching. Preaching is not preaching. That's why the Greek word kerugma, which is taken from keruzo, specific information, not generalized information. I determine out of all the materials of Genesis to Malachi, I determine to know nothing in it. The only thing I want to know in that material is Christ and him crucified. It's not just preaching. It's not just preaching. So the diet the believer is fed is critical. It's not just preaching. Yesterday somebody asked me on live broadcast, what can I do to grow spiritually? That's a very good question. And I told him, desire the sincere milk. Not just milk, but the milk must be sincere. If there is sincere milk, it means there is adulterated milk. It means there is fraudulent milk. That's why Brother Paul specifies what the believer must feed on. The preaching of Jesus Christ. If you're following, say, I hear you. So the way they handled the Old Testament, their activity was to announce Christ, the apostles. There was more than Christ in the Old Testament. There was more than Christ. There was history about wars, marriages, births, genealogy, which was key. I mean, you will see wars in the Old Testament, marriages in the Old Testament. You will see all manner of things in the Old Testament. All right? But the essence of the genealogy that we see in the Old Testament was how Christ will emerge. That's why all genealogy ended with Christ. And even the genealogy was biased. That's why we don't know where Peter came from. There's no genealogy on Peter because that's irrelevant to us. So the genealogy is as it affects Christ. Why? Because the entire book is his book. So it was about Christ. Even the history was biased. We didn't see the history of how Paul was born. Because we don't need it. The activity there was key. The preaching of Jesus Christ. So the history was the history of the Messiah. The history was his story. You didn't hear that. The history was his story. Okay. The history in the Bible. So the question is, how did the apostles handle the Old Testament? Are you in the house? Please, if you're now shot, I'm in the house. Don't forget where we came from. We're trying to deal with material wealth. But we have to establish doctrine here. We have to be fundamental, okay? All right, now let's proceed. Romans 16.25. Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery. The preaching of Jesus Christ is according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. The preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation. The word revelation there is the word apocalypsis. It means to unveil or to uncover. Apo means away or from. Calypto means to conceal. So within the Old Testament, Christ is revealed. The revelation, the unveiling, apocalypsis. 
according to the apocalypse of the musterion or according to the revelation of the mystery so let's deal with the word musterion it means to be explained or to be taught or to be spoken of to be explained to be taught or to be spoken of musterion what seems to hide christ in the old testament so the question will be what seems to hide christ in the old testament the stories the stories seems to hide christ in the old testament all right other occurrences practices all of that seems to hide christ that is in the midst of these too many stories christ is lost if you follow all the narrations the wars the marriages you know the cities and the events in the midst of all those stories christ is lost that is why it's a mysterion. If you follow the shadows and the practices and the activities in the midst of all that, Christ is lost. You see? And that's why when a church is full of activities, too many activities, they lose the substance. When a church is full of activities, marriage seminar, Singles and mingle, you know, dating by proxy, entertainment by comedy, music concert. You know, when all of that fills a church, the message disappears. When there are too many stories and events, you lose the substance. I don't know if I'm teaching here. I don't know if I'm teaching here. Yeah. That's why the moment the message is over, there shouldn't be too many activities. Because if there are too many activities, you lose what you learned. When a church is full of activity, just like the Old Testament, too many activities, too many stories, so the message gets lost. That's why the Old Testament is less. Because less is more. That's why we don't have too many activities here. We are not an event center. We are a teaching center. We are not an event center. We are a teaching center. And if you are allergic to teaching, this church is not good for you. If you have an allergy where teaching is concerned, you can't thrive here. It won't be good for you. If you like a lot of entertainment, you can't function here. Because this is not an event center. This is a teaching house. In a short while, I'm going to show you that. This is a teaching house. So what is of uttermost importance in the midst of all the events is the message. So what concealed Christ in the Old Testament is not God. What concealed Christ in the Old Testament is not God. It's the other events. Man's activity. Man's thought pattern. That is what hid Christ. Man's understanding. That is what hid Christ. So when you read the Bible and you say God has hid it. It's not really God that hid it. It is actually man's activity. Too many activities of the Old Testament that hid God from man. And that's why the word musterion is used. It's from the word more. M-O-E-O. -E used just once. Philippians 4.12. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed. I am instructed. Both to be full and to be hungry. Both to abound and to suffer need. I know or I have learned. Is the word more to learn. So musterion is what should be learned. Musterion is what should be explained or what should be taught. Musterion. It has to be taught. It has to be explained. It has to be learned. Alright. Musterion which was kept secret the word secret there 
in Romans 16 25 is relative word which was kept secret that word secret there is the word sigao sigao means silent which was kept secret or which was kept silent now let's let's see where the word silent was used Luke chapter 9 verse 36 and when the voice was passed Jesus was found alone and they kept it close and told no man in those days any of those things which they had seen they kept it close secret cigar then look at Luke 18 39 and they which went before rebuked him that he should hold his peace but he cried so much the more thou son of David have mercy on me that he should hold his peace that is, he should not tell anybody. He shouldn't say anything to him. All right? It's relative. Look at Luke 20, 26. Sigal. And they could not take hold of his words before the people. And they marveled at his answer and held their peace. They kept quiet. They held their peace before the people. So Sigal is relative to an audience. Relative to an audience. For example, Acts 12, 17. But he beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace. Declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. He beckoned unto them to hold their peace, to keep quiet. Not to say anything further. To stop talking about this matter. So the word cigar is relative. For example, Acts 15, 12 to 13. Then all the multitude kept silent and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God hath brought among the Gentiles by them. Next verse. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. They held their peace. So that word is relative. It is used for a particular audience. For example, see the way it is used in 1 Corinthians 14, 28. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Let him keep silent in the church, but let him speak. Let him keep silent in the church. Let nobody in the church hear him, but let him still be speaking so God hears him. So it's relative. All right? Sigao. Is relative because it talks about an audience, a particular audience. Now, so Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Please pay attention. Now, to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the Mysterion, which was kept secret since the world began. It was not kept secret from God. But it was kept secret from an audience. An audience couldn't hear it. It was kept silent from an audience. Why was it kept silent from them? Because there were too many activities and they couldn't figure out the message. Since the world began dealing with Kronos and Anion. Kronos. In the different events, in the circle of events. Too many events. So because of that, they couldn't pick out the message. Now, but verse 26 says, but now it's made manifest. What was kept secret from them is now made manifest. And by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedient of the faith. Is now made manifest. Paul used the word mystery about 25 times in reference to the explanation of the Old Testament. So look at the word mystery. This key, everybody, look at the word mystery with me. Matthew 13, 11, write it down. Matthew 13, 11, Mark 4, 11, Luke 8, 10. And this is where Jesus was discussing salvation. He calls it the mystery of the kingdom. Or what should be taught or explained about the kingdom. Unto you is given to know what is explained about the kingdom. When they asked him, why do you use parables to speak? 
He said, because seeing they see, but they see not. Hearing they hear, but they hear not. So because of their level of perception is why I use parables. I don't want to use parables. But if I don't use parables, they will not understand anything. Are you following? So that's why he used parables to explain the kingdom. And Jesus used the word mystery for himself. He was actually the mystery. He was actually the mystery. That's why they were looking at him and they didn't know they were looking at God. They were touching him, but they didn't know they were touching God. So he wept over Jerusalem. Because they didn't know the time of their visitation. They didn't know that what they were waiting for was among them. Walking among them. So Jesus was a mystery to them. So he said to them, you are seeing me but you cannot see. You are hearing me but you cannot hear. You are dull of hearing. No wonder when he rose from the dead, he rebuked those guys and called them fools. And slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have said. So the people's understanding limited them. From comprehending God that was among them. From comprehending the personality of God walking among them. Are we here? Now, that's the truth about what Jesus came to the earth to do. Jesus' parables, all of them, all the parables were pointers to him. About his walk. About his walk. So if he deviated from any of the things that were spoken of him in the scriptures, he will have deviated from what the prophet said. His parables and teachings were about himself. You know, it was about himself. Uh, it's like somebody asked me the other day, uh, Dr. Damina, what about the parable of the wise and foolish virgins? That some Christians are wise, some Christians are foolish. That's not, that's not it. Remember again, parables are not literals. A parable has fictions and a parable has facts. And then out of a parable, there is a lesson. So the foolish and wise virgins was a parable Jesus was giving to the Israelites that, that, that he has come, but they were not ready for him. That's all. That's all he was saying. All parables were pointing to Jesus. All the parables he gave them, he was trying to communicate himself to them. Using parables. Every parable. That's why all the parables were parables of the kingdom. And Jesus is the kingdom. That's why he will say to them, the kingdom does not come by observation. But the kingdom is among you. What is simply saying? The kingdom is here. I am the kingdom. But because you see, you can't see. You hear, you can't hear. So since you can't comprehend me, I will use parables to communicate me to you. I don't know if you are following here. That's why he was using parables. Because of their level of perception or comprehension. Now please follow carefully. This is very critical and this is very important. So Paul uses the same word mystery in Romans 16, 25 to 26. He uses the word mystery in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 1. He uses the word mystery in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 7. Still explaining the wisdom of God in salvation from the Old Testament. Then in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 1, he uses the word mystery. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 2, he uses the word mystery. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 2, mystery. That which needs to be explained. In 1 Corinthians 15 51, he said, behold, I show you a mystery. Where is he showing them the mystery from? The Old Testament books. I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. He was showing them a mystery from the Old Testament books. But we shall all be changed. Paul explaining it from the Old Testament. I'm explaining a situation to you. I show you a mystery means I'm explaining a situation to you from the Old Testament. That from what I gathered from the Old Testament writings, we shall not all sleep. From what I gathered from the Old Testament books. All right, Ephesians 1 9, he calls it mystery, the gospel of salvation. Then Ephesians 3 3, Ephesians 3 4, Ephesians 3 9, Ephesians 3 3, Ephesians 3 4, Ephesians 3 9, the Pauline gospel, mystery. 
Then Ephesians 5, 32. See the way brother Paul will use the word mystery. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ. You see? All the things he talked about marriage. Husband, love your wife. Wife, submit to your own husband. No man yet ever hated his flesh, but nourish it and cherish it. Even as Christ the church. All that talk, talk. He now say, hey, this is a great mystery. But what I am using the metaphor of marriage to communicate is Christ and the church. I'm not teaching marriage. What I'm teaching is not marriage seminar. I'm using the analogy of marriage to unveil Christ and the church. I'm not doing marriage seminar. My focus is not marriage. There are some churches every Sunday is a marriage service. 13 weeks of marriage revelation is another gospel. There is no marriage revelation. There is Christ revelation. You didn't hear me. There is no revelation like that. Somebody asked me yesterday, what is your take on healing school? Healing school? What is particular about healing? That it requires a school. Is that the gospel? Healing is not the gospel. The gospel is Christ. When Christ is preached, the sick will be healed. Healing is a byproduct of the gospel. So we don't focus on healing. We focus on Christ. What healing school? It's, it's still part of the tricks. It's still part of the tricks. To just gather people by all means. And most of the people that come to those healing schools don't care about Christ. They just want to be well. They don't care about Christ. They didn't come for Christ. What did you say they should come for? Exactly. They are not looking for Christ. They're not looking for Christ. They just want to be well. And that's not the gospel. The gospel is not healing. The gospel is God's power to save. Say, I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. The gospel is God's power. So when you preach Christ, out of preaching Christ, people will be healed. Let me show you Acts chapter 8, verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached what? Christ. What did he preach? Power city. Talk to me. What did he preach? He preached Christ unto them. Again, what did he preach? Did he preach healing? Did he preach healing school? What did he preach? Christ unto them. And what was the effect of preaching Christ? And the people with one accord gave it unto those things which Philip spake. And out of what Philip was preaching, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed and many taken with palsies and that were lame were what? Healed as a result of preaching Christ. When we preach Christ and the hearer understands Christ, from Christ healing flows. From Christ, bodies are restored. From Christ, lives are reconstructed. From Christ, businesses are, are, are restored. Miracles. We don't focus on things. We focus on him. When you see him, in him, things are taken care of. Say, I hear you. He preached Christ. He didn't go to Samaria and start a healing school. Same thing with Paul. All the apostles. While they preach Christ, things happen. In Acts chapter 5 verse 42. And daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach what? Jesus Christ. That was their meal. That was their diet. That was their food. In the temple, in house fellowships, wherever they met, they preached Christ. There was nothing else. It was not Christ plus. It was not Christ minus. It was Christ, 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 and Christ alone. Say, I hear you. I'm not hearing you. Say, I hear you. All the sermons, all the seven and eight sermons of Acts, all their sermons was Christ died, he was buried, 
on the third day, he rose again. All the sermons, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 7 and 8, even Stephen's message was Christ. Paul in Acts 30, all Christ. That is the diet of the church. And that is how the apostles handled the Old Testament. So the word musterion is to explain spiritual realities, both from Jesus' commentary and Paul's commentary. So musterion, therefore, is a work of the spirit. That's why it's called apocalypsis. It's a work of the spirit. Revelation knowledge is a work of the spirit. Ephesians 6, 19, look at it. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Utterance, that I may make known the mystery of the gospel. The musterion, the explanation the teaching of the gospel. Colossians 1, 26 to 27. He said the mystery is Christ in you. The hope of glory. Christ in you. The hope of glory. Give me verse 28. Whom we preach. Christ in you. The hope of glory. Whom we preach. Whom we preach. We preach a whom. Whom we preach. We don't preach and eat. We preach a whom. I marvel that you're so soon removed from him. We preach a him and we preach a whom. We preach a person. What's his name? Jesus Christ. Warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. That we may present every man perfect where? In Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. Alright, so both salvation and its attendant realities is what is called musterion. Salvation and its attendant realities is what is called musterion. In Colossians 2.2, 2, Colossians 4.3, the mystery of God's wisdom in Christ. First Timothy 3.9, he calls it the mystery of the faith. Second Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.7, he calls it the mystery of iniquity, which is negative. And the ministry of iniquity is disobedience to the gospel. Disobedience to the gospel. That is the mystery of iniquity. So the word mystery is woven around spiritual realities. And this was a study of the apostles out of the Old Testament. Let me ask you a question. Was there history in the Old Testament? Let me hear a good answer. Were there wars and conflicts in the Old Testament? Were there human interactions in the Old Testament? But was that the study of the apostles in the Old Testament? Exactly. Why? Because all the events which has historical value, referential value, and we will see a few of them in this course of study, all of them, if handled immaturely, will shield the truth away. If those historical details are handled immaturely, by the time we finish, you will not see Christ. All you will see is how David finished Goliath. All you will see is how the ground opened and swallowed people. All you will see is if I be a man of God. Somebody wrote on Facebook. He said, all these men of God that say, if I be a man of God. Then the person say, da, now wash. <laughs> da, now wash. <laughs> if I be a man of God, let fire come down. Da. Now wash. Even if I be a man of Satan, I can bring fire down. Haven't you seen native doctors bringing fire down? Oh, you have not seen? And this fire they bring down is common science. Common science. Only illiterates fall for it. Educated people who read science will not fall for such tricks. Because there is powder they sell in China. When you get the powder, 
All you need to do is walk up yourself to sweat. The moment you sweat, if you take that chemical and rub your head, the moment it mixes that water, it turns to fire. So the man will put prayer requests on the ground. If I be a man of God, he's walking up the sweat. He's walking up the sweat. The powder is already on his hand. If I be a man of God, if I, everybody say, yeah, today you will see fire. Yes, Lord. What did I say you will see today? Fire, holy. The man is walking the sweat. The moment he knows sweat has gathered in his head, he will say, fire. You will see fire. Vop. Everybody, ah! He has, he has, he has bamboozled them. Illiterates. Educated people know that a combination of dark powder with sweat produces fire. It's not coming from any heaven. It's coming from simple common sense. A combination of earthly products. But when the message of Christ has disappeared, when history and activities have taken over, anything can be preached. And anything can go. Not in a church like this. Where your discernment is sharp. Anything doesn't go anymore. So there were so many activities in the Old Testament. You will read and see a good piece of history. But what needs to be explained. And learned by the church out of all of that. Is Christ. Is what? Is Christ. First Timothy 3.16 and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest where? In the flesh. Justified where? In the spirit. Seen of angels. Preached unto the Gentiles. Believed on in the world. Received up into glory. Thus the message. So what was Paul explaining to the church? Everything in the Old Testament? Huh? Talk to me, church. Was Brother Paul explaining to the church everything in the Old Testament? Okay. What was he explaining to the church? Christ out of the Old Testament. Is that clear? It was the preaching of Jesus Christ. Now, do you remember the encounter of Philip with the eunuch? He met the man reading Isaiah. And he said to the man, Understandest thou what thou readest? What did the man answer? How can I, except some man, should guide me? So what did Philip do? Beginning from the same place. He didn't say, leave that side. Let's look at another side. Uh -uh. A good preacher will preach Christ from anywhere. Beginning from the same place where the man was reading. He explained Christ. From the same place. Irrespective of where he is reading. It doesn't matter. The same thing you are reading, let's bring Christ out. That is a man that has, that has understood the message. He preached Christ to the man, beginning from all the apostles, all the apostles. Their emphasis was Christ out of the scriptures. Are we together here? So there was a training given in the church about the Old Testament. There was a discipline, a training. A discipline given to the church. There was such, you know, an, a knowledge, a learning given to the church about the Old Testament books. In fact, if you look at the longest, the longest narration of history was by, by what was the name of this guy that was stoned? Stephen. Chapter 6 and chapter 7 of Acts. Stephen was talking from chapter 6 to chapter 7. He went through the history of Israel. How they moved. How they came out. How they settled in tents. How they walked from one place to another. At the end of all Stephen's defense. After two, two chapters. He ran it up by saying. The just one. The holy one. The son of God. He took them and zeroed the whole thing. To the son of God. The second person that had such a long narration. Apart from Stephen was Paul. Paul in Acts chapter 13. Now, Paul's sermon and Stephen's sermon was the same. They said the same things. It's just that Paul had a finesse about the way he said his own than Stephen. Maybe if Stephen had used the same kind of nice way of putting it, they wouldn't have stoned him. 
But Stephen was very brutal. Stephen was very brutal. He called them stiff-necked people. Then he said to them, God does not dwell in temples built with hands. Ah, what took them 46 years? You are telling them they wasted 46 years. If you, if you read very well, it was at the point where he useless their temple that they carried stone and started stoning him. But Paul didn't talk about their temple. Paul didn't talk about their temple at all. Right at what Paul says, the promise that God made to the fathers, he has fulfilled. By giving us Jesus Christ. So he respected the fathers. But Stephen said, both you and your fathers, everything you people have been doing is useless. God has never lived there before. <laughs> well, at this point, Stephen was ready to die. He didn't care anymore. That's why he said, hey, as you're stoning me, the heaven has just opened. In fact, I'm seeing the Son of God standing at the regency on high. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. Before you even finish me, into your hands I commit my spirit. I don't even want to be here anymore. Glory! Glory. See, when Jesus becomes your focus, the things of this world lose value. The things of this life lose respect. When Jesus becomes your value, nothing in this world anymore is what you are worship. Are you following my flow? That's why the revelation of Jesus is final. You can't beat the revelation of Christ. The reason why believers are too materialistic and too bothered and concerned is because they have not seen Christ. When all things that surrounds become shadows in the light of you. When everything becomes a shadow. When Jesus shows up, everything loses relevance. When you see Jesus, it changes the demographics. Somebody shout hallelujah. So the history they focus on was the history that led to the revelation of Christ. So when Paul was instructing Timothy, if you look at that first Timothy 3.15 as I'm rounding up now to close. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself. Where? In the house of God. What did he call the house of God? Which is the church of the living God. Then what did he say the church of the living God is? The pillar and ground of the truth. The church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. The mainstay of the truth. The pillar, the ground of the truth. Now please follow carefully. Two words. The word pillar and ground of the truth is where something finds its strong expression. Where something is held. The church is where the truth about God, the message of Christ is held. That is in the church, our mainstay is his message. Our mainstay, he is the truth. So the church is the pillar where Christ is revealed. People shouldn't look for God outside. People should know where to look for God in the church. Our mainstay, the ground, the pillar of truth, the revelation of Jesus. And this is what the, 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 the apostolic fathers, when after they have finished looking at the Old Testament, they arrived at the pillar of truth. They arrived at our core. Our core. And that core is what we call the creed. Of Christianity. The creed of Christianity. I believe in God the Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection. That just like he rose. We will rise again. Because I believe. That Jesus is the Son of God. That's the creed. That's, that is to say. What makes Christianity Christianity. Are these fundamental truths. That is this fundamental truth. Is what makes you a Christian. In the first place. Before we even talk about epignosis. And talk about revelation knowledge. If you don't believe in these fundamentals. You are not a Christian. That is where Christianity begins from. That God became a man. Without controversy. Without controversy. 
That is, this matter is not up for debate. No controversy. That God, anybody that doesn't believe that is not a Christian. That God became a man in the person of Christ. Died, was buried on the third day, rose. There is no argument about that. No argument. And that after he rose, he seated at the right hand of the Father. He has shed forth his spirit among all of us. Anybody that doesn't believe that is not fit to be a believer. I believe that Jesus died. He was buried. On the third day, he rose again. But beyond that, I believe that Jesus is God. Beyond that, I believe that Jesus is God. Because anybody that doesn't believe that Jesus is God is not fit to be a Christian. It's not fit to be a Christian. Christianity is predicated on the fact that God came to man. God came to man. Man couldn't get to God. So God has come to man. I didn't hear a powerful amen. amen. Lift your right hand and say, I believe. I believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. One God manifested in three functions for my redemption. I believe that he died, he was buried. On the third day, he rose again. I thought he would stand up and say these words. I believe that Jesus is God who became a man and died so that man can be united with God. In the death of Jesus, in the death of Jesus, he brought man into union with God. I believe that immortality lives in my mortality. And I believe that one of these days, my mortality shall be swallowed by immortality. Corruption shall put on incorruption. I am born of God. That is my blessed hope. I thought somebody would shout a powerful amen. That the man that is born of God is born again spirit soul and body you are born again spirit soul and body and you have escaped from corruption you are a partaker of divine nature what is in god is in you what cannot defeat god cannot defeat you zapotakalayana the life of god flows in your body if there's a witness in the house, let me hear a powerful amen. amen. Say the life of God is at work in me. Say I have what it takes to function as a part of the God class. I didn't hear your amen. amen. Father, I pray for everybody under the sound of my voice this morning. In this building, on television, in all our campuses, on Facebook and YouTube, wherever people are gathered to watch and hear these words. I pray that this revelation grows big in our hearts. The revelation of the reality of the Christ. The revelation of the manifestation of Jesus in these last days. And I pray, oh God, that everyone here continues to see Jesus through the pages of the scriptures. That this revelation, which is fundamental, continues to enlarge itself in our hearts. I decree that everyone here is strengthened with might in the inner man. Christ dwells in your heart by faith. You're rooted, you're grounded in love. The enemy has no playground around you in the name of Jesus. And I declare you continue to enjoy the victory that is yours in Christ, complete in him, the head of all devils. And right now I address sickness and disease. We exercise authority over every sickness and disease in this building and watching on television and around the world. We rebuke you in the name of Jesus and we command sick bodies be healed. Sick bodies be healed. Sick bodies be healed. In the name of Jesus. And Jesus healed them all. And I declare that this week is a week of miracles for you. A week of miracles. Every area of your life where you are believing for a miracle. I declare over you right now. Receive that miracle. Receive that miracle. Receive that miracle. Receive that miracle. In the name of Jesus, you're blessed beyond the cause, kept by the power of God. Grace is upon your life. In Jesus' precious name, 
and every believer in victory in this house shouts that amen on a note of final letter well go ahead and celebrate the victory that you have in christ jesus welcome back ladies and gentlemen welcome back oh my goodness what a service what a time of learning a time of unlearning and a time of relearning the word of his grace brother paul says i commend you to god and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and give you your inheritance among the sanctified. The word has come with clarity. Please don't go away. If there's anything that was wrong in your life, the word of God has gone forth to fix it. I rebuke sickness. I rebuke pain. I rebuke confusion. I rebuke discomfort. Now receive healing. Receive a miracle where you need one today. In the name of Jesus, receive a miracle. I clear every confusion out of your life. We rebuke fear and the hold of darkness is broken in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. I'm excited. Now listen very carefully. I want to encourage you. I have a lot of books, like you can see them displayed on the screen. All of these are resources written painstakingly to equip you, answer your questions, and bring you clarity of explanation of the Word of God. Shoot email to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com and we'll respond to you properly and give you all the information you require to acquire these books. You can order them from our office, either the books, the CDs, or the DVDs, Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. Shoot us a mail today with your orders, and we will ensure that we reach out to you today. If you're in a city where there's no church, where the message of Christ like this is preached or taught, that is already an opportunity for you to serve Jesus by getting involved with ministry. This is the way it works. All you need to do is shoot us a mail. We will take time and equip you and prepare you to begin an extension of our church ministry called a campus where other believers in your locality can assemble with you in your own venue and learn together with you the message, pray with you, and together all of you can reach out to more people with the truth of the gospel. Or you're in a place where you desire to just belong to the campus, shoot us a mail with your location today. We'll connect you to the nearest campus to where you are of our ministry. It's always a joy to serve you the grace of God. Always a joy to bring you clarity, to equip you, to build you up in the knowledge of Christ. I'm excited today. Looking forward to hearing from every one of you today. And don't forget to stay tuned for the next broadcast that comes up in a few hours from now. Share with people about what God is doing on this platform. And until we connect with you again, enjoy the grace of Christ and be blessed. Amen. Amen.